Good morning, everyone from Washington, D.C. again, and um, good, more, good afternoon to those joining us from Argentina. I'm Lindsay Munson. I am the Assistant Director of Admissions here at Georgetown's McCourt School of Public Policy. Just want to thank everyone for joining us today. It looks like we have a really good turnout. So. Um, Today's presentation, we're gonna be going over uh, graduate degree programs at the McCourt School of Public Policy, talking a little bit about student life um, here at McCourt, but also in the DC area. Um, and then also kind of going over some admissions information about the application process itself. Um, we'll take questions at the end. Um, so if you guys have questions, I'll uh, open it up at the very end of the presentation. If you could put those questions in the Q&A box, um, on the Zoom screen instead of the chat, that would be uh, perfect for us. And we'll kind of go through what we can at that point. Um, if we're not able to get to your questions, we'll offline get back to you. So we'll make sure that all your questions are answered. So um, we'll go ahead and, and get started then, I guess. Um, so the McCourt School of Public Policy, at, as you know, is at Georgetown University, which is located in Washington, D.C., um, the policy center of the U.S., the nation's capital. Um, and as you can see from the first slide, uh, that picture right there is as you would walk through the front gates uh, of the university. So that's Healy Hall. It's the kind of the most iconic building at Georgetown. So if you've seen any pictures of the university, you've probably seen this building. Um, so for those of you that uh, haven't visited, the DC or haven't been to Georgetown, this is kind of a good uh, view of the front. So the McCourt School of Public Policy is actually right behind Healy Hall. So it is in, let's see, Old North building. Um, so this right behind Healy, so this is Old North building. Um, we It is the oldest working building on campus. So there's a lot of history here and actually those steps right there um, walk right into the first floor of Old North. Um, we've had about 13 presidents that have given speeches from there, from George Washington um, to Abraham Lincoln, all the way to Barack Obama. So um, it's a lot of, uh, lot of unique uh, history there and very uh, unique place to study and kind of, I get to walk up those stairs every day. So that's, that's uh, you know, pretty exciting. So um, just a little bit of history about the building. Um, we have four graduate programs at the McCourt School. So we are a graduate school only. Um, we became the McCourt School about five years ago because we received a pretty large gift from one of our alumni, Frank McCourt, um, which allowed us to become our own school. We were the Public Policy Institute prior to that and have been around since the 90s. So we have been doing this longer than five years. So um, we've been around for a while, but we have four graduate programs which we're gonna cover today. Um, our first one being the Master of Public Policy. Um, we have a full-time and evening option for this program. So a part-time option is also available. We have a Master of International Development Policy. It's a full-time only program. Our newest program, which we're really excited about to roll out this fall, is the Master of Science and Data Science for Public Policy. And that is also a full-time only program. Um, and then we have our program for mid-career professionals, which is the Master in Public in Policy Management. And you can do that on a full-time or part-time basis. So we're going to go through all four of these, uh, all four of the curriculum uh, in the next few slides. So starting out with the MPP curriculum. So this is our flagship program, um, meaning it's our oldest and largest program. So uh, we have 125 students that join the program each fall for the full-time section and then about 20 students that join for the part-time section. It's a 48 credit hour program so you can complete it in two years as a full-time student and three years as a part-time student. So 48 total credit hours, 30 of which are core courses um, and we do consider ourselves to be a pretty quantitatively rig rigorous MPP program which we think sets us apart from other MPP programs uh, basically because I think most other MPP programs require two quant courses and we require three. Um, so it really signals to the market that McCourt graduates are ready to go out into the workforce um, and do data analysis as it drives evidence-based policy decisions. And this is really kind of our philosophy behind all of our programs and the way we kind of look at it is there's a ton of data out there but not 
a ton of resources. So if we can educate our students with the skills they need um, to do the, a data analysis efficiently and be able to kind of apply that to small sample sizes of you know, new policies or programs, and then based on that evidence, uh, recommend whether or not to implement this or not, um, we think it would save a lot of time and a lot of money. So um, a lot more efficient. So that's kind of our philosophy behind a lot of our, all of our programs actually. Um, so you'll have your three course quantitative methods se sequence, which will be statistical methods, regression methods, um, and then finally advanced regression and program evaluation uh, methods. So that's a three course quant sequence. You'll have two semesters of intermediate microeconomics. Um, you'll have three pol political institutions and processes courses. So um, with each of these courses, you can choose to do either the domestic course or the international comparative course. Um, so a lot of people think that the MPP program is just domestically focused, but it's actually not, not ours. We do allow um, kind of an international comparative option for these three courses. Um, you'll then have your capstone, which you have a, as an MPP student, the option to do either an individual thesis, which is more individual research or a group-based, client-based project where you're going to be actually working with a group of MPP students for an actual organization um, and kind of helping them with a, a policy issue or problem or program um, that they would like some assistance with. So you'll be doing research and data analysis and then at the end of the year you'll be presenting them with your recommendations. So it's a really good kind of practical um, application of what you've been learning uh, in the MVP program and kind of applying it to real life situations that these organizations are facing. Um, so those are two options for the capstone and then you'll have 18 credit hours of electives. So we don't have any formal concentrations for our MPP program, but if you'd like, you're welcome to in informally concentrate um, in any kind of policy area of interest. If you go to our website, um, and we'll kind of talk about more electives later, but there's a list of sample electives kind of broken out by policy areas. So you can kind of see what popular areas are and kind of what those popular electives look like. And that's just a sample. So it's not comprehensive. Keep that in mind. Um, but you know, you, if you don't want to concentrate in one area, you can mix and match. You can take uh, more skills-based courses. Um, you also have the opportunity to take uh, electives at Georgetown's other graduate programs, and it would count back towards your 18 credit hours of electives at McCourt. So, um, you know, you could take courses at the business school, um, so McDonough School of Business, the Georgetown Law Center, um, or the Walsh School of Foreign Service. Those tend to be the most popular for our students. Um, but a lot of students don't really even feel the need to do that because we do, at McCourt, offer um, a good variety of elective opportunities. So most people can kind of find what they're looking for within the McCourt curriculum, but that's always an option. So it kind of gives our students lots of opportunities. Um, there is no internship requirement for the MPP, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, career development later, but about 90% of our students do at least one internship during their time at McCourt, 35 to 40% do three to four. So um, really great opportunity to get that real world experience in a safe environment while you're in graduate school. And so our international students do have the ability to, to do internships. You know, it is something you need to kind of take a look at with our Office of Global Services um, and kind of your visa requirements. Um, but we do have for the MPP program about 30%, 35% to 40% of our students are international. And so they do have a lot of success finding internships during their time um, at McCourt. So that's the MPP curriculum. Um, moving on to the MIDP curriculum, so Masters of International Development Policy. Um, this is a very small cohort because it is a very specialized program. So it's about 20 students. Um, then I see somebody's putting in a question. So we're going to um, hold off and answer those questions at the end, um, but I'll keep that in mind. So that'll be the first question I, uh, I answer. So, um, but yeah, moving back to the MIDP curriculum. Um, so it's definitely more of a specialized program. It's a for 20 students. That's why it's a smaller program. So it's not as a, much of a generalist program as the MPP pro program is. Um, it's going to be more core heavy, less electives, just because you're kind of already specializing in international development, but it is based on kind of the layout of the MPP program. It's just more specialized. So you're still going to have the 
quantitatively rigorous uh, quantitative method sequence, so three of those. Um, all of your core classes are going to be have some sort of international development spin to them. So whether it be case studies um, or uh, data sets, they're all going to be examples that are related to international development issues. Um, then you're still going to have the intermediate microeconomics for two semesters, but as you can see, that's for development. And then you'll have uh, two classes that are kind of in, re related to development policies, so social and economic development, and then sustainable development. Um, and you'll have two courses in uh, management and institutions, so management, leadership, and ethical issues. Um, and then, I guess, I guess that's just one course, so in the political economy. So those are uh, your core courses. Um, the capstone requirement, you only have the option to do the client-based project, so there is no thesis option. Um, another difference with the MIDP is that it is, um, there is no, um, there is no thesis option for that. So you would have to do the group-based, client-based uh, project. And then um, there is a summer experience uh, that is required of the MIDP program. So as it's different than the MPP program where it's it's not required, it is required. And because it is, it is typically funded through the program. Um, and a lot of our MIDP students go abroad for the summer um, to kind of complete these inter internships for an international development um, related organization. And then you have 12 electives. Um, again, this is kind of where you can further specialize if you'd like. You still have the option to take courses outside of McCord at Georgetown's other graduate programs. Um, but yeah, that gives you a little bit more flexibility and gives you the opportunity to kind of dive deeper in certain subject areas. Um, so this is a full-time only program. We do not have a part-time option, unfortunately, um, but it can be completed in two years. Um, and then here's our next, our newest program. Uh, the Data Science for Public Policy. It's our newest program. We're really excited to roll this out this fall. Um, we've kind of teamed up with our data analytics department here at Georgetown. So there's a Master of Data Analytics and we've kind of married the two curriculum um, for this, this new program. So kind of the idea behind it is that we've seen a disconnect between computer scientists and policy experts. So um, kind of with an increasing need um, for students to have the skills to analyze data and big data, um, we've seen a disconnect between um, computer scientists and policy experts being able to communicate to each other and then also, um, you know, being able to communicate about the data to those that are making the decisions. So um, you're going to be, it's more core heavy. This is another specialized degree. It's only 39 credit hours. Um, it is a two year full time program, though. So it doesn't mean it's like less rigorous um, than our. 48 credit hour programs, it just means that there's actually the courses that you're going to be taking are going to be um, a little bit heavier lifts. So you're going to have a little bit more work outside the classroom. So preparation and then also kind of homework and doing kind of the data sets and practical um, applications of the the skills that you're learning. Um, so it's half uh, curriculum coming from the data analytics side and half coming from uh, the McCourt School. So you have the policy expertise and then the data skills. Um, so you're going to have, uh, it's definitely quantitative, quantitatively rigorous. You're going to have quantitative social sciences, two courses of advanced statistics. So this is actually the three course quantitative method sequence I was discussing earlier in two semesters. So um, it's accelerated and uh, definitely going to be uh, a little bit more advanced um, than the slower pace of the MPP program. Then you'll have your found foundations of public policy. So this is intermediate microeconomics and then policy process and public management. So these are from the McCourt side of uh, the curriculum. Then you'll have your civic data science, so intro to data analytics, massive data fundamentals, um, data visualization, which is currently an elective offering for our MPP students. Um, it's one of our most popular elective offer offerings, but this is actually going to be a required course because like I mentioned, the communication piece is key here. Um, and we kind of see is like, what's the point of having all this data if you can't communicate it to someone um, that's making the decisions that doesn't necessarily have that background. Um, so you're kind of making it more digestible, easier for them to understand and more interesting. And then you'll have statistical learning. And those are, are mostly from the uh, data analytics side, except for the data visualization, that's a McCourt elective. Then you'll have an ethics and law class. Um, so ethical and legal 
context for uses of data, which we think is um, increasingly important as you know, we have access to all this data, so, so using it ethically is going to be very important. And I think you'll see this um, in a lot of our, our programs, we have some sort of ethics and leadership kind of component, which is um, kind of where our Jesuit values of Georgetown come in. It's about educating the whole person and men and women in service to others. So ethical leadership is really important and you'll see that kind of weaved throughout the curriculum. Then you'll have uh, two electives only. So again, it is core heavy, but um, you have options to do like examples are network science, natural language processing, data visualization too, um, and pattern recognition pattern recognition. So um, lots of different opportunities where you can specialize more um, in the, the um, either in the data analytics side or you can take more policy oriented courses. Um, we'll be using the, um, I think we'll be talking about some prerequisites a little bit later. So there is um, some technical abilities and evidence of that that we would like to see, but pretty much you'll, we would recommend you having um, experience in R or Python or Stata um, will be the languages that are they're going to use for the data science program. So, um, and you don't have, there is no capstone requirement for the data science. Um, there is a data science and action seminar series that you'll be required to uh, participate in. So this is kind of another reason why it's a 39 credit hour program instead of a 48 credit hour program. It is, it's kind of designed to be a practical program. So this is going to be uh, seminars kind of discussing uh, current issues um, and using what you're learning in your classes and applying them to, to real life scenarios. So um, very exciting program. We're really excited. We're hoping to see about uh, 25 students join us for our first cohort, um, but that will obviously depend on the, the applications that we receive and, and the quality. Um, so it could increase. I mean, we are seeing a lot of interest in this program. And then last but not least is our MPM, so Masters of Policy Management Curriculum. Um, this is a program for mid-career professionals, so we do recommend students having about five years of professional work experience. Um, it's not a requirement, but it's not a requirement that it be policy related. Um, so we do have students that have just five years of professional experience and are using the NPM as a way to pivot. Um, the, it's a one calendar year program full-time and then two calendar year program part-time. So we have the summer institute. So it's a summer start. The rest of our programs are fall starts. So we have uh, four summer institutes, which are week long um, courses that you'll take the summer prior to uh, your first summer. And if you're doing the part-time program, you'll take two of institutes your first summer and then two institutes the summer between your first and second year. And so those are innovations in public management, public policy process, ethics and public policy, decision-making for public policy. And then you'll have your three semester core courses. So economic analysis for public policy, research methods and management and program evaluation. So um, kind of how we describe the MPM and the difference it is between the MPP um, is that the MPM is really taking a 30,000 look at, at policy and is really um, geared for folks either in management positions or kind of wanting to be in management positions. So it's not going to be as in depth in the data and quantitative uh, pieces as the MPP curriculum is, but it is going to give you kind of the frameworks and skills necessary to manage um, folks that are, that do have those skills and that, that do have those uh, job responsibilities. So we kind of explained it as our MPM graduates are, are typically managing our MPP graduates. So that's where the economic analysis comes in. So you'll be kind of learning the key concepts that you can be critical of data and critical of data analysis, but you don't have to actually um, be the producers of it. So you're going to be uh, more of the consumer and critical consumers to know whether or not it'd be a good policy to or program to put in place based on what you're being presented with. Um, and then the capstone is a semester long project. Um, so it's a, a paper on a uh, particular area of policy, so it, of policy management, so advanced policy management project. And typically the students will come up with the topic um, kind of with guidance from their thesis advisor or capstone advisor, um, and then work throughout the semester to, to do the research and, and write the paper. 
Um, then there's 12 credit hours of electives, um, which again is up to you whether what electives to take. All of our McCord electives are open to our MPM programs. Um, you're also welcome to take electives at our other graduate schools at Georgetown. So 36 credit hours, one year calendar year program um, for the MPM. And then here's a sample of electives. Um, you know, there's more on our website, but again, um, we try to tailor our electives each year, to, depending on kind of our, our interests of our students. So our academic team sends out a survey um, and asks if anybody has uh, certain elective topics that they'd like to see. Um, so they kind of will bring in new electives each year and each semester to, to meet the needs of our current student body. So that's pretty uh, unique and customized for our students. Um, we also have a lot of adjunct professors uh, coming in from any, another reason it's nice to be in the DC area is that there, some of our courses are actually taught by current policy practitioners that are working in DC um, during the day and then coming to teach a class at night. Um, so and another thing for our electives, we do try to offer um, as many elective offerings as we can in the evening. So our evening students, part-time students can um, also uh, have as many options as our full-time students. So um, I would definitely encourage you to take a look at our website for more examples. Um, if you don't see something uh, or a topic area, you can always email us. At, um, I'll have our email address at the end, uh, but you can email us to, to, for more elective information and we can let you know if we've offered something like that in the past or plan to offer something in the future. Another thing to mention about electives is that we have a consortium agreement um, with other local DC area schools. Um, so that's George Mason, George Washington, University of Maryland, Howard, and American. Um, so they also, same thing as what our other the agreement with our other graduate schools at Georgetown is, is that there's a specific elective um, at one of those universities, you're welcome to enroll in that as well. So you just need to work with your academic team um, here at McCourt who they have contacts at these other universities and can typically enroll you in those courses. Um, yeah, so there's just tons of, tons of opportunities available for um, elective offerings. And then we also have dual degree programs. Um, this is only for our MPP program, unfortunately. We don't have options for our other programs um, just because there's not as much flexibility. But the, the, our dual degree programs allow you to complete two master's degrees in the time that it takes to do one and a half at the price of one and a half. So we have um, an MPP JD option, an MPP MBA option, an MPP Master's of Science and Foreign Service option, an MPP and Magis, which is um, Masters of Arts in German, German and European Studies, and then we have two PhD options, the PhD in Government and the PhD in Psychology. Um, most of these you can apply during your first year at McCourt to the subsequent degree. The only one you can't do that for is the Foreign Service. So you have to apply to both the MPP program and the Foreign Service School simultaneously. So for example, the, uh, they're accelerated degrees, so a lot of the Credits will count towards both programs. So for the MPP JD degree, you can finish it and as a full time, and these are only for full time students too, um, in four years. Um, so instead of doing the MPP for two and the JD for three, which would be a total of five, you can do it in four years. Um, for the MPP MBA, you can do it in three years. So instead of two years for each program, you kind of are cutting down a year. Um, then we have. Uh, the, oh, another thing is that you have to apply, uh, the application process is completely separate um, for all of these programs. So we actually don't know, uh, I guess there's an option on the application where you can state you're applying to a dual program, but we won't know which one. And we really don't take that into consideration um, unless you, you mention it in, in your academic statement. Um, so the, the admissions committees for each of these programs are completely separate. So it isn't until you've been admitted to both do we really know. Um, and at that point, we you know work with our other contacts that are other programs to identify the joint degree students. So we make sure you're meeting with an academic advisor um, to make sure you're meeting the requirements of both programs. So those are really great opportunities um, if, if you're interested um, in, in getting two degrees uh, at an accelerated pace. And then 
We have a couple international program options. This is again for MPP students only. Um, we have an MPP IO MBA, which is International Organizations MBA, a uh, dual degree where you'll be spending your first year at McCourt and then your second year at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. You can apply to this program simultaneously or you can wait until your first year at the MPP program and apply um, during your first year. And then we have a couple fall program options, um, international exchange options that would happen in your fall semester of your second year. Um, so you can go to the Hurdy School of Governance in Berlin, the Lee Club U School of Public Policy in Singapore, and then the Jindal School of Government in India. So these you can all apply to um, once you during your first year. So you can kind of take some time to think about if that's something you would want to participate in. So really great international opportunities. We also have um, one elective course where they're going down to Costa Rica, I believe, um, this year to do, I think it's like a week long international course. I think it's, I think it's three credits. So it's an intensive learning course where they're doing some policy related work um, and, and studying for a week in Costa Rica. So they're trying to expand some of our international program offerings um, and doing them for credits as well. So that's an exciting opportunity that's uh, being implemented this year. Okay, so that's the uh, most of, about the curriculum. So now we're gonna be moving to more of the student engagement opportunities and student life at McCourt. So beyond the classroom, um, we think this is just as important as uh, inside the classroom. So I think you'll, if you talk to students, current students, I'm happy to put you in touch. They'll kind of um, echo what I'm saying basically that it, the environment here is very collaborative and supportive and it's not as competitive. So while we do want you to do well inside the classroom, we want you to take advantage of as many outside the classroom opportunities as you can to get that you know, experiential learning um, and practical experiences. So you know, two years in DC, there's tons of opportunities. I think our students usually have trouble narrowing down what they like to participate in and figure out what their time allows because there's just so much going on. Um, but it is important to kind of get involved in student organizations and, and do some of our, you know, do some internships or do uh, get involved in some of our research centers. So we're going to be talking about um, kind of all these opportunities in the next few slides. So to start off with our student organizations, um, if you go to our website, there's a full list there. Um, we have, these are all student organized and student run. We have a one staff, dedicated staff member. She's the associate director of our student affairs and she works really closely with the student government um, and other students to, uh, I guess, work, ha help with the organization and funding of these programs. Um, but we have, uh, a Georgetown Public Policy Student Association, so a student government. Um, if there's not a, a student organization that we currently have, you're welcome to start your own student organization. Um, you just have to put the proposal together and it goes through the student association um, and they will approve whether or not um, you can start the program, but usually it's a yes, <laughs> so as long as it's um, applicable. So um, then we have, we also have a public policy journal. So Georgetown Public Policy Review, it's a student-led uh, journal, peer-reviewed. Um, they do a hard copy publication as well as a um, e-publication. So each year they, they take articles from students as well as uh, you know, just scholarly papers from outside of the university and they um, publish them in the, the public policy review. Um, they have a spring edition each year where they tackle a certain topic. Last year, I believe was disruption, um, which was pretty relevant to kind of the uh, political economy here with the election. Um, so they didn't really know how relevant they would be when they came up with the topic. But then this year, I believe it's uncertainty. So um, they'll, they'll take blogs and papers that kind of are around those topics and they'll publish them there. Um, we also have some regional based uh, student associations. So we have a Latin American Policy Association. Um, we have a, I believe, a South Asian, um, an East Asian Policy Association. Um, and then we have some 
policy specific, like policy area specific programs. So we have, um, you know, women in public policy initiative, we have education policy, eduwonks, um, we have we have a farm, which is the Food and Health Association, um, and then we have an, an energy and environment um, club. So all of these clubs bring in speakers and big names um, to kind of speak with our students on campus. So they'll coordinate events um, to do panels or um, informal discussions. Um, we also do a McCourt School Policy Conference, which is led by our students, so it's a week-end-long conference, um, and they pick the topic and kind of do all the scheduling and content for the conference. Um, so lots of different opportunities, lots of ways to get involved. Um, we have also a, a couple that are more geared toward experiential learning. We have the McCourt Policy and Practice, um, which is kind of international development focused, and they take a group of students down to the Dominican Republic each, each year to do some service-based work um, and kind of using their skills they've learned in the classroom and applying it um, on the ground for underserved populations. So they've done some sustainable development projects there. Um, so they're applying their skills learned in the, in the classroom um, to a real life setting. So I, I know they just went, a group went down to kind of survey the damage after all the storms and kind of work with organizations to figure out what projects they can, can tackle this year. So um, lots of opportunities to get involved there. And then we have also a policy innovation lab that works locally in DC. Um, and they do, again, some work with some local nonprofits and doing some service-based work um, around policy uh, at the local level. So they, they tend to work in wards seven and eight of DC, which is in um, near the Anacostia uh, River, um, which can is, if you know DC at all, is a little bit of the um, underrepresented and underserved population. So they, they focus their efforts there. So um, we really think we, we offer a lot in terms of student organizations and we're always open to adding additional groups and organizations um, with tons of opportunities to get involved um, at McCourt. But then there's also Georgetown in general. Um, you know, there's, there's other organizations that are open to all Georgetown students. Um, so you're welcome to kind of take a look at those offerings and get involved wherever, wherever you are interested in. Another um, great, uh, I guess, aspect of the McCourt School is to be exposure to policy leaders. Um, you know, being in DC does not hurt us. <laughs> um, so we do have access to uh, big names and policy. So from our course instructors to our guest lecturers, like I mentioned, we do have adjunct faculty that come in um, each year and teach a course um, kind of on their, what they're working on and kind of applying actually what happened maybe that day to their, their lecture that evening. So um, really exciting opportunities to interface with the policy leaders. Um, I will tell you that our, our class sizes aren't really larger than 25 students, and that's typically for the core courses. Um, elective courses can be as small as 10. So you'll really find that you're able to kind of just have individual discussions with your professors and, and develop relationships. And our professors tend to be very involved and engaged with our student body. So um, it's really great opportunities for our students. We also have um, what we call policy dinners, which each semester we bring uh, a current employer of, a, of an agency or um, a think tank or you know, maybe the World Bank or something, somebody to come in and actually have dinner with a small group of students at a nice restaurant um, on the waterfront here in Georgetown. So it's a really kind of intimate setting where our students kind of get to ask um, you know, about that, that person's job, how they got there, it's their ability to do some informational interviewing, some networking, um, to get insight from, from an actual person in maybe their dream job. So um, that's also a unique opportunity at the court. We have a lot of lecture series where we're bringing in um, lectures, lecturers and um, from other universities that are experts in the field um, or from certain industries or sectors that come in and, and do different lectures that all of our students have access to. Again, our policy innovation lab, um, you know, you're going to be working with folks that are actually doing work that you may be wanting to do. Um, so you're getting that exposure to them um, and then also having that practical experience and working with them. So it's also a, a great networking opportunity. 
And then again, um, you know, we have tons of events on campus at McCourt and Georgetown that our students have access to. So as you can see, we've had Obama um, come to visit. Um, we had Paul Ryan, um, we've had Elizabeth Warren, all of them coming to campus to kind of talk about big issues. Um, and it, it's just a really unique, unique opportunity um, for our students. So um, always something going on on campus. Um, and again, with our um, a large gift that we received from our alumni, alumni when we became the McCourt School, um, we were able to start our Georgetown Institute for Politics and Public Service. So we call it GU Politics for short. Um, the slogan for GU Politics is public service is a good thing. Um, politics can be too. So um, it was the executive director is a Georgetown undergrad alum and he uh, when he was on campus uh, as an undergrad, he noticed there was a little bit of a disconnect between what was actually going on downtown um, in, in Washington, D.C. and what was being brought to our students on campus. And since we're so close um, to D.C., like he thought that that was, you know, a little bit of a missed opportunity. So he has developed this institute um, where he's trying to pull back that red curtain and kind of um, allowing policy leaders to come to campus and interface from, with our students. So not our students are able to learn from them, but they're also able to learn from our students. So um, they bring five fellows um, to campus each year or each semester actually um, from that are pretty big names in policy. They just announced the five fellows uh, for this semester. We have Katie Wall Shields. Um, she's former deputy chief of staff for operations for the Trump administration. We have Eugene Scott, a political reporter for the Washington Post, The Fix. Um, we have former chief of staff to minority leader Nancy Pelosi. Um, we have the first lady of Virginia. We also have president and chief executive author, Senate leadership fund and American Crossroads. So we have, they change each semester. Um, so the fellows, they they basically come back to school. Um, so they lead student strategy teams where our students can apply to um, work with them closely on whatever initiatives or policies they're currently working on. They help them with marketing strategies, campaign strategies, um, kind of just helping them you know, with whatever they need. So they're really getting that face-to-face uh, -face time with some, some big names in policy, which is, is really helpful. Um, and then also our, our fellows are kind of learning from our students that are currently in school um, and can offer, always offer new ideas and perspectives to what they're working on. Um, Geopolitics also does a lot of event programming. They, they did Clinton 25 recently, which a few weeks ago we had um, a whole weekend symposium where we reflected on President Bill Clinton's um, successful election campaign uh, 25 years ago. We brought a lot of, uh, of Clinton's administration in to discuss their campaign strategies, what worked, what didn't work, what, what they have done differently. Um, so they had a lot of panels and speaker events where our students could come and ask questions and, and kind of just hear from, from them about their experience um, in that campaign. And then it ended with a keynote speech from President Clinton, um, which our students had access to. I mean, it was definitely a lottery, so not everybody was able to go, but it was really exciting to bring um, that programming to campus. So um, they do stuff like that all the time. They bring folks from both sides of the aisle to debate any sort of hot topic. Um, and you'll see that even the fellows will be, you know, have completely different stances on a certain policy, but they're, they're really great great colleagues and friends and they really enjoy kind of discussing the policies. Um, so it's, it's a good um, opportunity and kind of kind of seeing how people can dialogue about things they don't necessarily agree with in a productive way. Um, so it's a really great institute. Um, they're growing and they're in, increasing their programming. So um, definitely something to look at at our website um, and also possibly get involved if you join us at McCourt. Um, also tons of research opportunities here. Um, so our, if you go to our website, you can look at all the centers um, that we have uh, uh, that we're affiliated with. So this is just kind of a, a really small sample. Um, we also have a Baker Center of Leadership and Governance, which was also um, 
came about from a donation from another alum, uh, John Baker, um, and they kind of focus on the leadership and governance aspects of pol public policy. Um, one of the interesting things they do each year is they um, invite about, or they invite proposals for innovative solutions to policy problems or issues from students. And so students submit applications um, and they are reviewed by um, the committee and about and five Baker innovators are selected each year. And so they receive a $20,000 grant um, to kind of put that innovation and solution into fruition. So um, they work for about a year on, on their proposal and using the funding that they get uh, from the Baker Center and then at the end of the year they present their their progress and findings so at the Baker Forum so that's a really great opportunity here we also have a massive data Institute which is new um, which has also kind of allowed us to um, you know dive deeper into that massive data uh, in industry with the data science program. So we, we work with the US Census and we have access um, to tons of data um, for our students and our faculty to get involved in. But, and we have, I, I would just really encourage you to take a look. I can't even mention all the centers because we, we have a lot of opportunities in different uh, policy areas of int interest. So education, health, public and nonprofit leadership, international development. Um, the opportunities are endless. So we do have uh, research assistant opportunities, not only with our faculty members, but with our research centers. So um, the way that works is our assistant dean of academic and student affairs puts out a call for applications each fall. So you don't apply before you apply um, once you arrive on campus. And so uh, we'll have graduate assistant opportunities, research assistant opportunities, and teaching assistant opportunities available. So um, if you're interested in research, you can most likely work with um, one of our centers or one of our expert faculty um, to get that that experience. So, um, really, a lot of a lot of great opportunities there. So also again, transitioning from student life, moving on to career development. Um, we have a, a career development office that's dedicated to our McCourt students. Um, so you're not competing with undergraduates or um, doctoral students. We don't have any doctoral students at McCourt um, for their services. And they provide a, a, a variety of services from um, career counseling and advising. So one-on-one -on -one counseling and advising. Um, I should note this isn't a placement office, so it is what the student puts into it. Um, so we encourage our students to start talking with them at, right when they get on campus during orientation all throughout the two years that they're here. So we do have, um, we do think of your job search as a two-year process. It's not just going to be something you're going to start in your final semester. So they're available to kind of help you uh, set up for success when you graduate in May of your second year. So they have internship and job announcements. They do a lot of career events. So bringing, doing job fairs, employer info sessions. They'll do networking events um, with our alumni. They'll bring them back to campus. So we have um, about 100 alumni come one evening and kind of just we're at the Old North building and there was a reception where our students had the opportunity to kind of informally network with them um, and talk to them about their experience at McCourt and then afterwards. Um, they do interview prep and mock interviews, so they also bring alumni back to, to do mock interviews. So if there's a certain organization or position that you're really interested in, we have an alumni that works there, we're likely able to set you up with them to do a mock interview. So they can give you that insider information um, and kind of telling you what to prepare for and expect of the interview. So that's really helpful. Um, we do resume review, cover letter review. Um, there's an online jobs database. So lots of, lots of different resources available to our students. And then a lot of people want to know where our graduates go after graduating. So this, these, this data is six months after graduation. So um, it's not really comprehensive or indicative of where our students end up after that. So I think, you know, you'll see at the bottom uh, middle graph that a, a high percentage of our students end up being employed in the Washington DC area, but I think that that is, a, is just because we are located in DC and there's a lot of policy jobs in DC. So, um, you know, while, while a large percentage do end up staying in DC, I think it's a natural transition for them right after graduation, especially depending on internship opportunities um, that they've, they've been involved with during their time in the court to stay in DC shortly after. But we do have um, 
see students going back to their home states, their home cities, their home countries eventually. And so that really kind of has developed a very global network for us. Um, so we have alumni across the globe and across the country as well. Um, 90% of our students are in, employed within six months of graduation. So um, that's, you know, really great uh, for us to be able to say, and we're really proud of that. Um, and then when it comes to sectors, um, this really changes each year, kind of depending on a lot of different uh, criteria. So depending on the political economy, um, just like maybe if, if the government is, is there's a hiring freeze or, or whatnot, um, and kind of just also just the economy in general, it'll, it'll fluctuate. So we do see in this graph about a third of our students going into the public sector, a third going into the private, and a third going into the nonprofit. Um, this also, again, will change each year, but also we kind of see it as our students, we don't really think that they'll be in the same job for the rest of their career. So we see them transitioning between sectors, um, or really if they're in the the pub, private sector and working in policy, the chances that they're going to be working or liais liaising with the public or nonprofit profit sectors is really high. So really we're equipping our students with the skills necessary to be able to transition seamlessly th between the sectors. Um, so it's really a, a pretty even split. Um, again, for internships, we do have about 90% of our students that do at least one internship and then uh, 35 to 40% do three to four. So lots of internship opportunities that will hopefully set you up for success um, to have a full-time employment offer by the time of graduation. And then finally, <laughs> this will be quick and then we'll open up for questions, um, the admissions process. So the application requirements um, are listed on our website, but the the admissions committee here at McCourt takes a very holistic approach when we review applications. Um, so we're going to look at everything that you submit. Um, so we don't really have a set profile. We're really looking for um, a diverse set of individuals and kind of what each person can bring to the classroom. So um, we, you know, require the application. There's a supplemental data form. It's a $90 application fee. Uh, we require your resume or CV. We don't have a preference. Your academic statement um, is going to be a very important piece of the application um, because this is the only time you really hear from you in your own words about uh, why you're interested in our program and kind of what you're hoping to gain from it. So we see our strongest academic statements really focusing on, um, you know, your passion for policy what has led you to apply to a master's program in policy at this point in your academic or professional career, why you're interested specifically in McCourt um, in our programs, and then also what you hope to gain from the program um, in, in your career moving forward. And then also because we are quantitatively rigorous, um, we, it also helps to see that you also buy into that philosophy. So if you could touch on, you know, why those skills are important to uh, your career goals or kind of your policy area of interest and in improving policy in that area, um, that's also helpful because we want to make sure that you're a good fit, that we're a good fit for you and you're a good fit for us. So mutually beneficial. Um, we also require transcripts um, for international students. We will require official transcripts. So these need to be sent directly to our office um, from uh, your institution. It should arrive in a sealed envelope. If it requires a translation, um, you should take it to a certified translator. They will need to certify that they received it in a sealed envelope and then um, translate it and then send it to us directly in a sealed envelope. So basically the transcripts cannot be opened by the student or issued by issued to the student. So we need to make sure they're not um, tampered with, with in any way and, and make sure that they're official once they arrive to us. Um, so we will need transcripts from all institutions that you've attended uh, for undergraduate or postgraduate coursework. Um, a TOEFL or IELTS score is, is required if you're a non-native English speaker. Um, three letters of recommendation. We prefer one, one from a professional and one from an academic if possible. Um, if you do, if you've been out of school for a while and prefer to do three letters from professional recommenders, we just ask that you um, have one of them speak to some academic skill sets. So whether it be a uh, critical thinking or data analysis or communication or writing, if they could just touch on that and it's just helpful for us to see how that would translate into a uh, classroom setting. And then finally, the 
really exciting one, <laughs> standardized test scores. We do require um, a standardized test uh, for our NPP program. We'll accept the GRE, GMAT, or LSAT just because we do have a lot of dual degree programs. So we don't want you taking more than one test if you don't have to. Um, for our MIDP and data science programs, um, we'll accept the GRE or GMAT, but the GRE is strongly preferred. Um, no standardized test score requirement for the policy management program because we're going to be really putting a heavier emphasis on um, your work experience. Um, quickly, the prerequisites. Um, there is a principles and microeconomics prerequisite for our MPP and MIDP programs. Um, if you haven't taken this course, you can still apply without it. Um, it's possible to receive a conditional admission, meaning you just need to take it prior to starting orientation in the fall. So you can take it um, during the summer as long as it's from an accredited university for a grade and it's you receive a B or higher, you'll meet that requirement. If you don't have the course, well, we might look at other quantitative coursework that you've taken or put a heavier emphasis on your quantitative GRE score. Um, but it's definitely if you haven't taken it, you can still apply. Um, for our data science program, we recommend a college level cal calculus course. If, again, if you haven't taken it, um, we might look at other mathematics courses that you've taken and uh, recommend that you take it prior to starting the program. Um, and then also we're looking for evidence of technical ability. So either coursework or professional experience in computer science, advanced mathematics or statistics um, is what we're looking for there. And then also some familiarity with programming language such as R or Python is recommended just because you're going to kind of be kind of diving in. So having that foundational knowledge is helpful. Uh, work experience uh, for the MIDP program, we have two years of relevant postgraduate professional experience um, is recommended. So some international development um, experience is preferred. Um, this just is because it's such a specialized program. We want to make sure you know that's what you want to do um, after you graduate. And then also it, it adds to the classroom environment and makes the kind of cohort unique because all students have some sort of um, relevant experience that they can apply to class discussions um, and in their, their assignments. So, and then also for the MPM, five years of professional work experience doesn't have to be necessarily policy related. Our MPP and data science programs do not have a work experience requirement. Um, for MPP, it's, we do see our students having on average about two to three years of, of uh, professional experience, not necessarily policy related either. Um, so we see students coming straight from undergrad, students that have a few years of professional experience and are using the MPP as a way to pivot. And then also students that have always known they wanted to do policy work and have some experience and are using it as a career enhancer. Um, Important to keep in mind application deadlines. We have our priority deadline coming up January 15th, 2018. Um, so if you're interested in being considered uh, for merit-based scholarship, you should definitely apply by then. Um, if you apply by the 15th uh, and the rest of your materials arrive by mid-February, you'll still be considered for the priority deadline. So um, we do give folks a little bit of a buffer to get materials in and we'll be notifying uh, applicants at the end of January if they're missing anything so they have time to troubleshoot before mid-February. And then our final deadline is April 1st. Um, that's the extended deadline. And here is a list of key contacts. Um, at the bottom you'll see my email address, uh, the McCourt Admissions General email account. So you're welcome to email me with any questions that you have about McCourt programming um, or uh, the admissions process. I'm happy to help. These are also the emails um, and names of our program faculty directors, you're welcome to reach out to them as well um, if you'd like a faculty perspective or kind of want a little bit more insight on the curriculum. They are very uh, responsive and encourage applicants to reach out. So they're happy to help. So we're all very happy to help. So now, finally, <laughs> I'll take some questions. If anybody has any, feel free to put them in the Q&A section, um, and I will try to answer the ones I can. And then if I don't get to them, uh, I'll answer offline. So for the, the question about the MPP for, for mid-career international students, it can be asking if it can be made into a one-year program. Um, for MPP, no, um, it is a two-year program. Um, if you're interested in, in a one-year calendar year program, the NPM program um, would probably be better, and that is for mid-career 
professionals, so at least five years of professional experience. Um, again, it starts in the summer and, and ends in the spring semester, so it's really good a May to May um, program. Um, so you'll have the four summer institutes in the summer and then you'll have two semesters worth of, of curriculum. And then someone asked about scholarship opportunities for international students. Um, all of our admitted students are uh, considered for merit-based scholarships uh, based on their original application material. So this includes international students and domestic students. We, it's mostly partial tuition scholarships, so they can range from about 7,500 to about 20, 25,000 a year. Um, our average award is about 17,000, and then about 60% of our students come in with some sort of funding. We do have, um, we do have five full tuition scholarships, which we call our McCourt Scholars, and those are full tuition. They cover all the mandatory academic fees, so health insurance, the gym membership, um, and then also includes a living stipend. So those are for our most competitive applicants, and we select uh, about, I guess, seven to 10 that are make the short list and they go through a competitive interview process and then the final five are selected and offered the awards. Um, so those are our scholarship opportunities. On our website, there's also external opportunities for um, domestic and international students or both. So I encourage you to take a look at that. You're welcome to email me if you can't find it, but that's for, for just ideas for outside folks to reach out to. Um, so, um, there's tons of, there's a, just a long list there. So you can kind of either supplement, either whatever kind of merit-based funding you receive with um, some outside scholarships. So we have a question, which statistic and economic software is used in the MPP? Um, I think it's mostly going to be R is what you're going to be using. Um, maybe some Stata, but it's mostly R. Are, I believe. Uh, for the data science, it's going to be a little bit more uh, technical. Um, I don't, I, I'm not as familiar with that language, but I can get you that information from our faculty director um, about the specific courses and what you can expect to use in each one. So we have a question about the MIDP program. How many international students does MIDP usually have? It's a pretty high percentage. Um, so again, it's a small cohort of about 20, and I think it's about 60% international. And then how much merit-based scholarships does a MIDP student on average receive? It's, a, it's the same um, that I mentioned for our MPP students. So uh, it can range from 7,500 a year to 20, 25,000 a year with the average award being 17,000. So usually like a $15,000 award, 17,500 or 20,000. Um, and they ask if there's a minimum required percentile for the GRE. Um, so again, we take a very holistic approach when we review applications, so we don't have any numerical cutoffs. Um, so we're going to look at everything you submit. So with that said, though, we do have averages. So our average GRE scores for the verbal section is 159. For the quantitative section, it's a 160. And for the analytical writing, it's a 4.2. Our average GPA is a 3.5. So again, if no numerical cutoffs, take a holistic approach. So if you do feel like you're higher in one area but lower in the other, that can always offset. We don't have work experience requirement for the MPP, um, but if, so it can't be heard. It can be counted against you. But if you um, if you have work experience, it can be helpful. So all of that is taken into consideration. So we have a question about, uh, do we have any elective courses about gender and women's studies? Um, I am actually not completely sure. I think we do. I would have to take a look. So I will look at that and get back to you, Maria, um, with specific information about that. I know you say, you say that GW has a specific program about gender studies. Um, and yes, again, if you, we do have a consortium agreement with local universities and GW is one of them. So if they've have a course that we do not offer that's specific to kind of what your interests are, you're welcome to work with our academic team to enroll in that course. Um, and it would count back towards your 48 total credit hours here. So um, the only stipulation there is that the first elective course, um, your first semester has to be taken at McCourt, but the rest can be taken at other graduate schools at Georgetown or anybody in our consortium agreement.
Okay, I think, I think that's all the questions, maybe. Oh, no, here's another one, I think. So, Maria, you can find information about that on our website. Um, she's asking about the Women in Public Policy Initiatives Program. Um, if you go to uh, the McCourt School's website and then go to About Us and go to Students, there is a tab that says Student Organizations and the Women in Public Policy Institute, I believe, is the fourth one and you can click there. They have a Facebook group. Um, I can also put you in touch with uh, the president of the group or a member if you're interested in, in talking with them. Um, the, anybody, if, they're if you're interested in talking with a student ambassador, um, they're listed on our website. Also under the student section um, about us, student ambassadors are listed by where they're from and policy area of interest. So if you're interested in talking with someone from a specific program or from a specific country or state um, or with you know similar profile and similar interests as you, you're welcome to reach out directly through the website. Their email addresses are listed. If you're looking for someone um, that isn't listed, so say somebody that's involved with a student organization or a research center, you can email me and I can try to put you in touch with someone so they can, you can, they can talk to you more about their experience. I'm happy to do that. Okay, and then we have a question about um, and where in the scholarship, or where in the application can you ask for scholarship? Um, so they're basically all international student or all admitted students, including international, are considered based on their original application materials. Basically, there's a checkbox on the application that just asks um, if you are interested in being considered. So it's simple as that. You don't have to submit a separate application or essay or anything. So we'll just you'll automatically be considered if you're admitted. Um, and we do try to issue scholarship decisions with the admissions decisions. So if you apply by January 15th, we, our aim is to, our goal is to get the decisions out by early to mid-March. So you'll hear your admissions decision as well as scholarship decision at that same, same time. So how long is the NPM health policy? Um, so the NPM, like, there is no specific concentrations for health policy um, or there is no specific concentrations for any of our programs, but for the MPM, um, you do have a good number of electives where you could focus on health policy. Um, it is a full time. It is a year long course or year long program. So it's one calendar year. So it starts in June with your summer institutes and ends in May um, at the end of your spring semester. There are some 100% scholarships. Um, those are our McCourt scholars. So we do have five of those. Um, they are, there's a short uh, list selected. Um, so we do have, we do select about seven to 10 students and those are tend to be our most competitive, um, strongest candidates and they'll go through a short interview process um, and then five will be selected. So they receive full tuition, they receive a stipend and they receive all their mandatory academic fees are covered. And someone asked about the sending the transcripts. Um, uh, you're asking if you can upload a scan copy in the application or do they have to send certified copies by mail. For internet, for all transcripts, we need them official ones and we need to receive them by mail. Um, just because in order to render a decision, we have to have the official transcript. So for international students, we recommend that you have your institution send it to us directly um, if they can and it should be an, arrive in a sealed envelope and be issued to the McCourt school. If it needs to be translated, you'll need to have your university send it to your translator or you can pick it up in a sealed envelope. It should not be issued to student. It needs to be issued to McCourt. Um, you can pick it up and take it to the translator. They will have to certify that they received it in a sealed envelope and then translate it and then send the originals along with the certified translations to us directly or seal them, sign them, and, and then you can send them to us. So we just have to make sure they haven't been opened by you, by the student. Any other questions? I'll give, it, I'll give people about two minutes and then we'll sign off.
again, if you guys, you know, have specific questions or think of them after the webinar ends, um, you're welcome to email me. I will email all the participants with the with the slides here so you'll have all the information um, our website is an excellent resource um, and you know please consider my office like a point of contact we are more than happy to help 